Pray these things in your name. And the people said, Amen. You can grab a seat. Well, my name is Carl, and it's great to be back with you here on Sunday morning. Um, last week I was at Melbourne Uniting Church and um, serving with them. Really love to be with them, but it's always great to be home, right? Um, so <clears throat> please open up in your Bibles to Genesis 9. Uh, we've been in a series going through the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, studying them week by week. And today's text is an awesome, extraordinary text. As all of Scripture is, right? All of Scripture is awesome and extraordinary. But there's just something about the text this week um, that hit me in a way that was striking. And uh, we're going to go, you know, this the text that was set before us was Genesis 9, 18 to 10, 32. Um, I got through four verses reading and I could read no longer, right? This is a text that is challenging, a text that is wild. Um, maybe something that might be, uh, that you don't know about me, is that I really don't like war movies. Um, war movies freak me out. Um, I go to the movies to escape reality, not to be hit with the harshness of reality. Um, the, I reckon probably the, the most wildest uh, war scene that you ever see in any movie is from Saving Private Ryan. I don't know if you've seen that movie, like with the start, you know, they, it's, it's this operation in, in Normandy where they land on Omaha Beach and all the ally, allies rock up on this beach and they are killed, knocked down at an extraordinary rate, right? In extraordinary ways. It's stunning to see how they're knocked down over and over again. And this scene goes for a while. And what stops being extraordinary is the people dying. What starts being extraordinary is that anyone survives, right? The thing that is stunning is that anyone is left standing on this beach. And this week I was reading this article by a man named Garrett Kell, and he writes this. It says, During my time in Bible college, I took a leadership course taught by the late, great Howard Hendricks. As we studied the life of David, Hendrick shared a study he conducted with a group of men in full-time ministry who had fallen into morally disqualifying sin. At the time, I'd only been a Christian for a few years, but unfortunately, the subject was all too relevant. During my early days, I'd witnessed several men whom I loved and respected fall into serious, sinful compromise. At one point in those days, the falls came so frequently as if I was on the spiritual beach of Normandy watching buddies' lives get blown apart all around me. Um, this article was written in 2015, as Garrett writes about what it was like to be a young guy growing up, seeing his spiritual heroes fall into sin. And what's not alarming uh, these days is it seems to be that when it happens again, you see a Christian leader fall from grace, it stops being stunning, sadly, right? It's more like now a roll of the eyes where we see God's men and God's women who were serving faithfully in the life of God's church all of a sudden fall out of that position of being able to serve. And this text here this morning, as I read it this week, I opened up to Genesis 19, 9 verse 18, and I started reading, and I was reminded of when I saw the movie Noah, right? I don't know if you've seen this movie before, but I didn't grow up in church, and so I don't know all the stories. I don't know how they all start and how they all end. They're not very familiar to me. And so when I saw the movie Noah, and it gets to the end of this movie and Russell Crowe, they, they kind of picture this scene where Noah gets drunk. I just thought they added it in, like added this thing in to rip off the Christian faith. And then you come to Genesis 18, and it is a stark reality of sin in this world. Let's turn our eyes to the text. It says this, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So pretty, pretty normal scene that we have thus far. Then you come to verse 20. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and laid uncovered. Now imagine that you're a young a young person, an Israelite, who's receiving the text of Genesis for the first time and you're working through the nine, first nine chapters and you're cheering Noah on, right? You desire to grow up to be like Noah and to be a man of righteousness and to serve the Lord and do something great for Noah and Noah becomes your hero and then you hit Genesis 9, 18 and you start reading and it becomes stunning, right? That someone could fall into such sin. And when I read it, I thought it was extraordinary and the great shame is that in the world today when a God's leader falls, doesn't seem to be stunning anymore, does it? Doesn't seem to be extraordinary. 
think of the list that come to mind of people that used to serve God and now their name is tarnished in the world and they can serve no longer. And I tried to push past this verse. I really did. I tried to teach the rest of the text, but I just got stuck here saying, we do, I believe, need to know what it means to prevent our heart from falling into sin. It's one thing to be shocked. It's another thing to roll our eyes. But it's another thing to learn the lesson of what it is when God's leaders fall into sin. And so this week I prayed and I just wanted to speak to us about lessons that we can learn from God's fallen leaders. That's what I have for us today. Not just so we can respond rightly to when they fall, but also so we can prevent our heart from falling too. And so the first lesson that I want to give us today from this text is that God is worthy of more than our talents. Amen? God is worthy of more than our talents. Now, certainly it is true that God is worthy of our talents. He's worthy of our evangelism. He's worthy of our gospel proclamation. He's worthy of us serving in ministry. He's worthy of us being on a roster. He's worthy of those things. But he's also worthy of something more. He's worthy of our holiness, right? Our obedience, our purity, Our serving people, even when no one sees our serving, he's worthy of our whole lives. And when you're trying to understand the Old Testament stories, it's a little bit different than the New Testament. You roll into the New Testament letters, and they are often instructions. And so you read an instruction, and how do you obey that instruction? You read the instruction, and you obey. But when you get to New Old Testament stories, and you're trying to figure out, what do I do with this story? You've got to ask a few questions of the text. And one of those questions is, What would have been surprising or stunning to the original audience, right? So the original audience is reading this text, they come to this section, and um, they would ask the question, what would be stunning to the original audience? And what I find so stunning is that this story is even included, right? You've got this story of Noah who's done all these unbelievable things for God. He was found to be righteous. He undertake undertook the building of an ark. Noah was resilient in building the ark in the midst of a godless world. Um, Noah gathered his family and animals to fill the ark. Noah remained faithful on the ark. Then he takes them off the ark and then leads them into worship. Why would you include this story at all? Just to smear the name of Noah. Well, what I think that it teaches us is that God is interested in more than our obedience just in the mountaintops of life, Right? that Noah was obedient on the mountain types of life, but God is still interested in more than what we can do when we're on the mountaintop, right? He's interested in more than what we do when we plant a church. He's interested in more than what we do when we're on platform. God is desiring holy and pure people. Um, Anglican missionary Charles Studd said, uh, Noah walked with God. He didn't only preach righteousness, he acted it. He went through water and didn't melt. He breasted the current of the popular opinion of his day, scorned alike the hatred and ridicule of the scoffers who mocked at the thought of there being but one way of salvation. Noah will forever be remembered as a man of incredible faith, but the recorded sin of Noah helped us answer the question, does God still require anything of us when we step off the mountaintop? The great shame is that many Christians today believe that as long as they serve God and the mountaintop, then I can do one for you, God, and then one for me. One for you, one for me. One for you, and one for me. But God requires something so much more than that. He requires our whole heart, our whole affection, our whole worship, not a corner of our life, right? Not a sliver of our life. God wants the whole thing. It's interesting that in Scripture, in the midst of all the calls to gospel proclamation, you enter into 1 Corinthians 10.31, and you have Paul speaking about living our lives for the glory of God. And he doesn't actually have the mountaintop in mind at all. He has the ordinary moments of life in mind. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Now, what's in view here? Eating and drinking. The ordinary common things of life is what he has in mind. Not just our Sunday service, not just all the incredible things that we can do when we can you know, release a song to the world and we can get a pat on the back and be very encouraged by that. But God looks at the very ordinary things of life and wants us to glorify him too. What are the ordinary things of life? The things like going to work, 
They're parenting your children, right? Um, young people in your 20s and 30s, it's going to weddings and going to receptions, right? The thing that we seem to do every other week. I'm 39, so I'm still in my 30s, right? The thing that we do all the time, the common and ordinary things, God is saying, please give me your heart. The Lord and Saviour of the world doesn't just want us to be giving him, his, uh, giving him our talents. He wants our holiness. He wants our obedience. When we step off the mountain, our lives still matter. Um, in the early 2000s, there was this little conference that started called Passion Conference, um, led by this guy named Louis Giglio. And this conference uh, has since grown to be quite extraordinary. It's held, it's held in you know, football stadiums and John Piper, Matt Chandler, you know, all the big names go and preach at it. Well, back in the early 2000s, we were running a conference at my church when Louis Giglio was like, it was small enough that you could get him on the phone. And so we, we called him and he came out to our church and he, um, from America to our church and preached at our conference. And then um, at the end of the conference that night, I got invited to go back to the hotel foyer uh, to meet with Louis and to meet with a couple of other pastors. And at 11 o'clock at night, with no social media to activate, right? No one else watching, no mountaintop experience. He stared at a young kid who was running a youth ministry of 50 people and said, how can I help? Right? Not a mountaintop experience. But I tell you what, in that moment, I was pleased and I'm confident that the Lord was too. The Lord wants not just our talents, he wants our obedience. Not just on the mountaintops, but in the valleys, amen? He wants more than our talents. So secondly, um, second lesson that we receive from this text is that God wants, or that humanity is extraordinary and capable of extraordinary sin, right? Humanity is extraordinary. You need to receive that, right? You are extraordinary because you are made in the image of God. It is a beautiful thing to be created in the image of God and to be blessed by being made in the character of God and the personality of God. In every single way we are like God, we are made in His image. It is a beautiful thing to know that we are extraordinary, but it is a humbling reality to know that we are also capable of extraordinary sin. Um, this is what Genesis 6 verse 9 says about Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, righteous, blameless, and he walked with God. And so to be righteous is to be one who delighted to follow the Lord. To be blameless in his generation is a statement of contrast, right? So in his, um, in his day, there were people that were walking far from the Lord, but he was not. He was a righteous person in contrast to everybody else. And to walk with God speaks of the intimacy that Noah had with the Lord. So they didn't have the law back then, they didn't have the Ten Commandments, but he had this intimate relationship with the Lord where people would look upon him. Moses tells us this man was extraordinary, extraordinary in his faithfulness before God. It is extraordinary that he honours God in such a way and therefore, therefore we should read it as extraordinary that he was capable of such extraordinary sin. After Noah's family was saved by the Lord, and so God promises to flood this whole world and he saves one family, Noah's family, because of his righteousness. On an ark, earth 2.0 begins and Noah's in it. And he steps off this ark and leads his family into worship, plants a vineyard, gets drunk and then gets naked. It's extraordinary, isn't it? We can look upon this situation and we can feel shame for Noah but we should also see that our hearts are exposed too. That we are extraordinary people capable of, capable of extraordinary sin. And when I was in Bible college in 2009, I, I was um, there with a friend named Chris Mormon. Uh, Chris Mormon is a pastor of a beautiful church in the States. And we're in this class where they said that uh, there are 10,000 ex-pastors in Australia, right? And some of those ex-pastors have kind of moved on to other jobs. But a growing number of those people have fallen out of ministry because of their sin. The question was asked, how can I um, avoid falling into this kind of sin pattern too? And the answer to the question that we were given was to um, recognise that we're not better than any of the other pastors who have fallen before us. Right? 
I'm not better. I can't walk through life thinking that I'm never going to commit sin. What I actually need to recognize is that there's this beautiful thing, that I'm created in the image of God, but this reality that many men and women who are created in the beautiful image of God have fallen to. What does Proverbs 16 verse 18 say? It says that pride goes before destruction and arrogant spirit before a fall. Pride tells the mind that it is invincible, invincible, but that invincibility is a lie. A proud person goes into battle blind to the enemy and it becomes only a matter of time before a fall comes. Now, what can often happen as a Christian is that you go on a church camp or you go to a Sunday service in worship or you have a great time in DG and you come to convince yourself that I could never sin again, right? I'm on too much of a high, I could never go back to that life again. But then what happens is that this kind of complacency sets in and rather than walking with the, with the Lord daily, we instead live off past seasons of intimacy with God rather than daily tending to our faith. But what does Micah say? Micah says, has he told you, or he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? right? If pride brings a fall, then humility brings a firm foundation. What walking humbly before the Lord is, is to say that I don't know how to walk at all, unless you teach me, unless you guide me, unless you fill me with your spirit, I cannot walk a single step without you. It might be that yesterday I had this beautiful, intimate, dynamic moment with God. I must choose not to walk in yesterday's intimacy, in yesterday's blessing, unless in, in yesterday's um, fulfilment in my life. Um, when we first uh, went to the church office, we, um, Beck brought in these plants for the office, right? These beautiful plants in um, beautiful pots, right? And filled them with beautiful water. Why are they dead today, <laughs> right? Because you can't live off the nourishment of what happened three months ago, Right? Every single day when we came into the office, I needed to tend to these plants, and I did not. And what is true of these plants is actually true of our walk with the Lord as well, right? We cannot live off what God did in our life months and months ago. That His past faithfulness was beautiful, but it does not carry us today. And we see that in the life of Noah. That Noah's life is this call to righteousness that finishes with a warning. If we live off what God did long ago, then a fall is likely to come. God is worthy of more than our talents, and humanity is extraordinary, yet it is capable of extraordinary sin. Um, the next lesson that I read from this text is that if God isn't done with you, then neither is the enemy. Now, one of the great and beautiful things is that if you're in this room breathing with a pulse, then God is still working in your life still growing you to be more like him, to be more like him. He hasn't quit on you. He hasn't done with you. Um, nothing can separate you from his love. Right? It is a beautiful thing. But the reality is, is that if God is using you for his redemptive purposes today, then the enemy still exists to bring you down. Uh, verse 20 in our text, Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk. Um, there seems to be an air of complacency that drifted into Noah's life. Um, we read that after the flood, he got into the business of cultivating a vineyard and it was the alcohol of the vineyard that he gets drunk on. Now, some people have tried to present an argument that Noah didn't know what he was doing. And so you, you were in Earth 2.0 and, and so the vineyard is experienced differently than other vineyards and he kind of accidentally runs into getting drunk, right? People that want to kind of preserve the legacy of, of Noah. And there's a couple of problems with that. One of the problems with that is that um, Noah's 600 years old at this point. He's a mature man, right? So people aged very differently back then when there was a world that could sustain life much longer. And so he's not an ignorant young person. He's 600 years old. He's got grandkids. He's been tending to a vineyard that is able to produce wine. And so he's been tending to it for quite a while. And so it is very, very unlikely that Noah had no idea what alcohol would do in his system. Um, secondly, what, what is true is that um, some people have pointed out that Noah didn't have the Ten Commandments at that point, and so he didn't really know that it was a sin to be doing this thing, and so um, we can't hold Noah to this account. 
The problem with that is that the first readers of Genesis did have the Ten Commandments, right? And Moses writes this story for them. And so if he's writing this story and he wants them to know that um, Noah's actions were accidental, then it's very strange that he wouldn't include this information in the text for us to know, right? Because the people who read it would have straight away seen that it was a sin. It's much more a straight reading of the text. We should assume that Noah knew what he had done. He knew that he had walked into sin and his, the end of his life was marked by a kind of complacency. And theologian A.W. Tozer once said, complacency is the deadly enemy of spiritual growth. Complacency is the deadly enemy. Now, why the deadly enemy, right? Because um, while it is true that we can be apathetic in our faith and we can procrastinate our faith, as the devil is described all through Scripture, he's never described in those terms. He's never described as apathetic. He's never described as procrastinating. The truth is that when we become complacent in our life, this creates opportunities for us to walk into sin led by someone who is resilient and persistent in getting you to have nothing to do with God's redemptive plan in the world. Complacency is the deadly enemy of sin. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians 5 uh, to a church who is falling into slumber, says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. God's people are pictured as people who can fall asleep at the wheel, right? We, come, we can become distracted with building our own world. We can come, become distracted by thinking, I mean, it was, it was only recently I was speaking to someone who said, um, I'm just taking a break, break from church and I'm not going to church anymore. And I just, um, I'm just doing my own thing for a while. And then, so we can walk into these seasons where we think that we can take this time off from God to start putting the crown on my own head, right? To build my own kingdom. That Jesus can take some time off from being king and now it's my turn to be king. But the truth is, is that Jesus is the king and he is the Lord and saviour of the world at all times. He doesn't take a break from being the king and the devil doesn't take a break from trying to rip God's people away from the church and away from spiritual maturity. Friends, the problems that happen in the church aren't because uh, situations are difficult and challenging, though they are. Um, rifts happen in the church. Um, churches shut down, not because of difficult problems, but because of spiritual apathy, because of spiritual complacency. We walk into situations where people become full of pride and they lack spiritual maturity and they chase their comfort instead of chasing God's maturity in the life of the church and the church crumbles. That's what happens. So Paul writes and he says, awake, right? Awake, O sleeper. James writes and gives us this promise. He says, submit yourselves, to, uh, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil does have incredible influence in this world, but he is not omnipotent. He's not all powerful. He has limits in his power, right? Those limits placed on him by God's word. And we're called to resist. And when we resist, what happens is not that the devil has, a, has less impact in the church, but the truth is that the devil must flee. And so we resist through worship. We resist through prayer. We resist through vulnerability. We resist through confessing sins to one another. We confess through difficult conversations, right? We resist through striving to grow in spiritual maturity, recognizing that complacency builds cracks in the church and that our resilience against a resilient devil, we receive God's promises and he must flee. And that's the kind of church that God desires. And so we've seen that God is worthy of more than our talents. Humanity is extraordinary, yet capable of extraordinary sin. We've seen that if God isn't done with you, then neither is the enemy. And lesson number four is that we are called to uh, admire heroes, but worship the Lord right? It is right that we have heroes, that we celebrate people, and we learn from them, but we're called to worship the Lord. Um, before I was really running with the Lord, um, I went to meet one of my heroes at the time. It was a man named Ronnie Coleman. Um, if, you've, if you know anything about bodybuilding, then Ronnie Coleman's a big deal, right? On Arnold Schwarzenegger put bodybuilding on the map, and Ronnie Coleman kept it on the map. And um, back in the day, uh, Ronnie Coleman was coming to Adelaide, and so I decided to go with a good friend of mine named Don Redden, 
and Don Redden and I went to go and meet Ronnie Coleman. I wasn't really walking with the Lord at that time. And um, I remember when we were going to meet him, um, I got the sweats, kind of that nervous sweats about going to meet a hero of mine. And um, Don was very, like, appeared very, very confused by my nervousness, right? Now, how do I know that? Because he told me. He was very, very confused by my nervousness. Now, I asked him who his heroes were, and he told me that his heroes, and he gave the list, and they were all men and women of God, right? And I was in that moment, like, and, and over those subsequent years, that I learned not only did I need to pick better heroes, right? And we do. We need to pick better heroes, but we also need to worship only one, right? We need to be careful who we idolize who we look to and who we put all of our faith in. We need to give worship to only one. Uh, In Hebrews 11, we receive this list of heroes of the faith. Some people call it the hall of faith because it's a list of men and women who who have displayed extraordinary faith. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. Right? And then it goes into this incredible list. It gets to the part about Noah. It says, this is extraordinary. By faith, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. So we look at the flood and we know the story. And so we look upon Noah and we can kind of forget that Noah didn't know what was going to happen. He had to take God at his word. So these events yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his whole household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. It is right that this man was celebrated, right? Um, As you go on and read through this text, this commendation that we read of is actually a commendation that comes from the Lord. And so God celebrates the faithfulness of Noah. This is a beautiful thing. But what we also learn in Scripture, when we come to these passages where sin is recorded, right? And um, what will happen is that people who um, like are antagonists against Christianity, they will look at Christianity and they will see um, men having many wives. They will see that um, men killed other men. And they would say, see, like, see your faith calls for you to do these things. It's like, no, these things are held up as what not to do, Right? Scripture reveals these things for us so that we might have a warning for us. And so we look at the lives of people like Noah and Moses and David and Peter and Paul, and we admire lots of things about them. But when their sin is on display, it's telling us that we are called to admire them, but to worship only one, right? We can learn things from people and admire people, but we worship only one. So let me say a few obvious things uh, right now. Um, Ravi Zacharias is not to be worshipped. Um, Brian Houston is not to be worshipped. Mark Driscoll is not to be worshipped. It's obvious things, right? Um, but John Piper is not to be worshipped. Matt Chandler is not to be worshipped. John MacArthur is not to be worshipped. These men and women of God, you might think, oh, but they haven't committed any sin yet. Yes, but the lesson that we receive is that these people have limitations in terms of what they can give you and they have limitations in terms of their perfection. They are people that we can learn from, but only one you find satisfaction in. There is only one who you can go to with all of your affection, all of your worship, all of your neediness, right? All of my brokenness and only one person can satisfy us. Only one person can give us the hope that we truly need. And it's not, this is true, it's not our grandfather, it's not that person that led us to the Lord. All of these people have limitations, but Christ does not. And so when people fall out of ministry, you can choose to roll your eyes, you can choose to be shocked, but you can also remember that Christ in his perfection is available for all of us, right? Your best mentor pales in comparison to the beauty of Christ. We admire heroes, but we worship only one. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Who is the He? Right? Fill in the blank that the mentor that you have, that you look to, that you love to get wisdom from, is not the He. The He is the person of Jesus Christ freely available to you, teaching you through his word. 
If you're going to run to anyone, right? You know when you get into difficulties and you have a fight with your husband or your wife and you, get, you jump on the phone? Before you make that call, contact someone else, right? Open up God's Word. Speak to the Lord through prayer because He's the only one that has perfection for you. And it might be through prayer that you actually never need to pick up the phone in the first place. God speaks profoundly and He speaks perfectly. So we admire heroes. We worship the Lord. So our lessons for today is God is worthy of more than our talents. Humanity is extraordinary and capable of extraordinary sin. If God isn't done with you, then neither is the enemy. Number four, admire heroes, worship the Lord. And lastly, in our fifth lesson from Fallen Leaders, is that we all need grace. Amen? We all need grace. With all of um, God's teaching, over thousands of years, we have not outgrown our need of grace. We have not evolved as a society, generation after generation, kind of heading towards perfect, perfection, where we will receive this, we will create this utopian culture without the intervention of God. That is not the way society is going. There is still sin pervading in this world, and because of that, we still need grace. Um, I wonder if you've noticed this about the text. Uh, what we have in the beginning of um, this world as the ark comes to rest on this mountain and this new world begins. We have the beginning of a new world. We have a garden. We have a story of righteousness, a righteous world. We have a story of sin entering the world and a story of nakedness being covered to hide shame. What we have here is something of an earth 2.0, right? And you might think that God has done this profound work through Noah or he's kind of eradicated sin in this world and through Noah we would live in this sinless world. But we must remember back to Genesis 8 verse 21 when Noah, where God makes a covenant with Noah and he says, And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of their worship, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now, it might be that you would read, I will never curse the ground again because humanity is perfect and they won't need a cursing, right? That's not what it says. It's actually God clearly knows that sin still exists in this world. And so he makes this covenant with the world that he's never going to again flood this world as an act of judgment. Because sin is still in this world. And because sin is still in this world, we haven't graduated from grace might be here and you feel like the sin of your past through either the things that you willfully chose to do or just your apathetic like relationship with the Lord makes you come in here and you look around and other people are worshipping and you feel like you're out of step or you're not in good company. You're in great company. Great company. Because every single one of us needs grace. Every single one of us needs Jesus. When the celebrity pastor or celebrity preacher falls they need grace what does this little old church in, in norwood need we need the grace of the lord to be at work in this church through humble hearts willing to receive it right humble hearts willing to receive it so we invite the band to come back up um, the good news for the christian leader who has fallen is that although um, access to ministry might not ever happen in the same way again, and you need to acknowledge that some sin that happens in the world through Christian leaders means that their access to serving in the way that they have in the past should not ever be returned to them. But the good news of Scripture is that in Romans 8, it's famous words, um, it's a description of what we still have access to. Paul writes, and he says, For I'm sure... That neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from what? From his love, right? Not just his presence. It's actually a character description of God, right? You might think that all of these things are going to get in the way of God's love for you. Actually, the scripture says that nothing will get in, his, get in the way of his love for you, Right? And so, you know, next time, like, we see a, a fallen leader in this world, instead of shock, instead of rolling our eyes, would we just take a moment to look heavenward and say, thank you, God, that we live in a world that has not graduated from your grace. You are still here, that you are still present. Thank you, God, that you desire more than what I can do for you. You desire my holiness. 
Thank you, God, that you give me mentors in this world that I can look to and learn from, but I thank you that I can put my faith in one who is dependable and I can come to you for all the grace that I need. Let's pray to the Lord. God, I thank you that you are a God of mercy and grace. I thank you for your righteousness that you bestow upon us. I thank you that when the Father looks upon us in that day of judgment, he will not see our sin, but he will see your Son. God, I pray that we would be a people who would be marked by grace. We would take this lesson from the life of Noah 